we'd be in awful bad shape, wouldn't we? I know there's many of you that's been with the organization since 1955. And there's been a lot and lot of battles. I think some of the first examples of the organization and where it went out to do its bargaining are quite interesting. Because if you think back at it 20 years ago to what it is today, it's quite a change. Because the first bargaining with processors went something like this. You have an interesting proposition. You may have some merit. But we see no reason to do business with you because we have no problem getting our supplies. You know, then came the holding actions. And we were termed a militant group. But I don't know about being uh, termed a militant group. I do know that out of that, we did receive some verbal uh, commitments. As time went on, we needed some sort of system to deliver our products. So a collection, dispatch, and a delivery system was developed. And again, the organization grew. And for many, I guess it got a little bit too big because major lawsuits and hostile government actions and gross misunderstandings by, by the news media began. And you know something, ladies and gentlemen, they were just more battles to fight. The slaughter cattle division grew with the organization back then. <clears throat> How many of you here today can remember those first written agreements in Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, South Dakota? There's some of you here today can remember them. If you remember them right, they were $2.50 under the yellow sheet. I guess it isn't that important to what it was because it was in the market at that time. But to think back at what we're doing today and what we were doing back in 68 and 69 seems phenomenal to me. In June of 1969, as Gary pointed out, uh, I came to work for the National Farmers Organization. I became the first person out of the packing industry to come to work for the NFO. And I felt that I certainly knew how to bargain and market and sell your cattle. And I felt that I could be probably one of the best quarterbacks that the national farmers ever saw. But we had one problem. Without a team, you don't need a quarterback. Without a team, who was going to catch that pass in the end zone? Because you didn't have a receiver. There's some of you people sitting here today that I recognize that were staff members back then. In 1962 and 3, I could hold a staff meeting in the men's restroom in the home office, and that isn't very big, ladies and gentlemen, but we'd still have more room for our staff. It got a little bit tiresome to keep on fighting and fighting and not get much done. You know, a quarterback without a team is just another man on the field. So in 1973, I left the organization, and I didn't go far. I kept quite well in touch with the, with the home office people. And I knew most of the people in the field at that time. And I knew and in 1960 or 1980, it was, I had an opportunity to come back to work for the organization. And I saw a team that was starting to take shape about a year prior to that. I saw a team of people in the field that would represent your cattle that you wanted to market and that the packer would take that representation. And I saw negotiators in the home office that had packer respect. Not only did the slaughter cattle team, not only was there a team in the slaughter cattle, but it was in the whole livestock division. And I was impressed with that slaughter cattle team. 
uh, it was one that I was glad to work with and build. As the blocks of cows and fat cattle grew over the past years, so did the prices you received. I wonder how many of us back in 1963 would have ever thought that the national farmers would be the only organization, the only individual in the country that could forward contract cull cows. They don't have a market for it, but we did it. We've been doing it. How many of us back then would have thought that we could have that we could price our fat cattle and our fat hogs months in advance. You know, that's what we all join the organization for. That's why I'm working for the organization, for the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Sure, there are times, people, that you can't always do it. You can't always lock in a price due to market conditions. But when you can, you have to use these forward contracts just to keep you in business. We've talked a, a little bit about the packer and a little bit about the organization and the cattle feeder. I'd like to discuss a little bit about marketing at this time. How many of you here today would like to sell your product, no matter what it is, on the top of the market? How many of you? Show of hands. Well, so would I. Definitely. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to do it. But how do we know when the top of the market has been reached? Who can tell me? The gentleman's right. You always know when you've reached the top of the market when it starts going south on you. Here's a transparency that's been around some time, one I like. It has to do with marketing. Do you know that 3% of the product is bought at the top of the market when it's on its way down? And 7% of the product is bought when the market's on its I got to reverse that. 3% when the market's going up, 7% when the market's going down. Now, 3 and 7 are 10. You take 10 away from 100, you end up with 90, right? Where is the other 90% market? It's marketed at the bottom third of the market, 90% of farm commodities. Some time ago, I had the opportunity to be in a marketing seminar. And in this seminar, and in this seminar, there was an individual by the doc name of Dr. Dennis Beagy. And Dr. Beagy has taken a, a survey. And I have used this for several years, and I've kind of changed it. I've my name for it is who's who in the marketing. Well, if you take everything equally, if you take choice steers, for instance, that will yield 61%, and they'll grade 80% choice, 20% goods, and they weigh in the vicinity of 11 and a half to whatever, 12. <coughs> Weights, the grades, and the quality are all equal. Dr. Beagie's survey indicated that any individual selling 10 head of livestock or less would fall in the bottom category of the market. An individual that would market 10 head or more would fall in that middle proportion of the market. And an individual that would market 10 head or more have the knowledge of the market and have some relationship with that buyer of that product 
would fall in the top category of the market. Now, many of you people uh, looking at the Omaha market or any of your live markets always see a range. You might see it from 58 to $60. You might see it from whatever that range. But if you got a 2 to $3 range in it. This is an example of why that happens. There are other reasons, but generally speaking, this is what happens. Now, to me, that isn't that interesting, because anybody who has been in marketing over a period of years knows that that's been going on since the beginning of time. The bigger, the better, right? You know, the more volume, the more you get, all this good stuff. But the ironic thing about it is that it took so long for it to come to the public's eye, just a couple of years ago. Let's get into some of the bigger and better and so forth. One of the most glamorous and prosperous segments of our industry today happens to be the feedlot industry in the Southern Plains. You know the ones I've talked about with the 60, 16,000 head or more and, and all that volume. Let's, let's look at kind of how they operate. You know the National Farmers started collective bargaining in 1958. The large feedlots started their operations around 1965. But they had a system and they had a team. That system all begins with a feed yard. Now you know you can't throw 16,000 head or more into one large pen and expect to accomplish anything with it. You'd have no control over it. So they divide that. They divide it in sections. And each section has responsibility of doing whatever that type of, the, whatever the type of cattle that they have in there. They may have heifers in one area. They may have uh, steers in another, top choice in another, uh, low goods. They got it all broke up. First of all, they need a, an individual to mix the feed for them because it's no, you know, normal that they all don't have the same feed ration. Then, of course, they have to have someone to keep an eye on them. So they've got cowboys in there that'll ride these pens daily and see if there's any distressed cattle in there. And if they are, they're pulled out and they're put into a little sick area where the vet can care for them. And then, of course, you got an individual that's, that's got to clean that pen. So you got that team right there. In each section, you got a team. They may vary in different feed yards, but there's one thing that they have in common, and that is a central located office in that yard where one man knows what's going on in each section. And he, has re and he has people telling him what's going on. He has people telling him how many days each pen has been on feed and what the rations they have been on feed. And he controls that. He knows when pen X and so and so is ready to go not within weeks, but within several days. They will be put on the show list. Well, what happens when they get on the show list? That individual buyer doesn't go in and talk to the cowboy or the, or the, the uh, veterinarian or something about a given low, uh, pen of cattle in those areas. He goes directly to the sales office, and that salesman in that office tells him how many days those cattle have been on feed, what the quality of the, the cattle are, and what they're going to cost. You remember I told you about those 
eight plants in that Southern Plains area, all killing over a half a million head annually. And those two plants that could, had the cat, uh, kill capacity of over two million. Well, those plants need these feed yards. They need them bad. And if they're going to pass any of the cattle in this feed yard, that's fine with that salesman because he knows that there's going to be another packer buyer following him. And very, very seldom do they ever get hung up with uh, any cattle. You can read week after week how, how they're current, that meaning that they're pretty well sold out for the week. We get the reports on how many they kill on a week, uh, sell on a weekly basis, and many, many times you'll see that they're current. Well, earlier I kind of mentioned about the big money people and the outlook for that small feeder doesn't look too good. And I said we may have to have an attitude of if you can't beat them, join them. I think I may have to change that terminology a little bit. I'm going to have to say, if you can't, if you can't beat them, be like them. After all, they have followed the pattern of the national farmers in collective bargaining. That's a perfect example of collective bargaining right there. But how do we do it? We don't have the feed yards to, to put the nation's cattle in, in these yards and compete with these people. So what we're going to do, and what we have done, and what we're going to do more is build our own feed yards. We're going to build our feed yards by state, though. And they're going to stay on the farm, but they're going to be represented as feed yards. And how it all works, I guess the best example that we have is the block of cows that, it, that is marketed, bargained for on a weekly basis in Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's a good, true form of collective bargaining because it starts with you as the individual. You may want to sell one cow that week, or you may want to sell two loads of cattle. You remember Dr. Biggie and his 10 head and his whatever? Well, the national farmers, through collective bargaining, has more than that 10 head. They have thousands. The national farmers knows what the markets are. And we have, de and we have developed a respect towards the packing industry. The packing industry will accept the national farmers sooner than they will accept any other organization in the country. And time and time and time again, it has been brought to my attention from the packing industry through that. The National Farmers kind of reminds me of that cigarette commercial. You know the one I'm talking about with the gal? You came a long way, baby. Remember that? Well, the organization has. And I want to give you a little example of our collective bargaining. We'll take and use county structure to build that individual feed yard. Let's say that this is the state of, of uh, Wisconsin. Right now we have three staff members in the state. And let's use them as examples of what I'm going to talk about. When an individual member in the state of Wisconsin or Minnesota, or for, for that matter, in many states that the organization is in, if they have something to sell, they will call a county meat committee man or a, a designated individual in that county. Now, if you don't have that, that, that type of structure, this is what our procurement people are starting to work on, to build that. It so happens that Wisconsin is set up quite well with this. But if an individual wants to sell something, he calls that county coordinator. 
and in turn that county coordinator gets in touch with the collection point representative in that area. The three people, the three staff members that we have in Wisconsin are in charge of coordinating six to eight collection points. And he works tightly with that group. He attends their county meetings. He attends the, the collection point board meetings. He tries to be a part of that given area. Well, when the collection point rep is ready, he'll call our staff man, or our staff man will call him and ask him how many he's going to have, how many head of livestock will he have for this particular week. And in turn, that staff man will call that centrally located office. It's a simple process. Now when you put all this together on a Monday morning, usually it's about Monday afternoon, we'll know what the head count is for the week, what type of cattle they are. And by that I mean how many cows and how many Holstein steers and how many colored steers and heifers. Not only that, but we will know what day they're going to be delivered. Now we've had some problems in the last couple of weeks with delivery. And an interesting thing happened. The packer called and he said, Andy, he said, your organization is getting too big. You've got to keep that number within a reasonable amount. And I said, well, you know, Gene, we're keeping within that 10%. And, you know, he, says, he said, that's not bad two and three years ago. 10% wouldn't hurt me any. But he says, do you realize what you're doing when you're talking 10%? of 15 to 2,000 head of cattle? He said, I'm going to have to hold over some of my cattle because you're gone over. Likewise, if it turns over the other way, if we're short, then his kill will be short. So the coordination has got to be real close, and it has been. The, the, the logistics on this is phenomenal. It is unbelievable. And who has done it? Not myself not Merle Sunken or Gary Ellis. It's the people in the field. They make it happen. The only thing that we do is coordinate it. The success of this, I want to show you. I have a marketing figure here from 1979 to 1983. And a lot of people have seen this. But it tells a story. It tells a story of what can happen when true collective bargaining works in marketing. The black line on top is the National Farmers members prices since 1979 to 83. The white line is the average price received by the individuals who sold their cows in the sale barns. Now, how do we get these figures? The University of Wisconsin is very co uh, cooperative with us in gi giving it. Once a month, a man by the name of Ed Lippert calls our office, and he tells us what the average price the state brought. And then, in turn, we tell Ed what, what uh, the National Farmers brought. Now what that individual does with it, I'll be damned if I know. You know, I, I think he puts ours in there and then tries to work it all out. I know what we do with it. We use it with, you know, examples like this. But I want to show you something. Everyone in the home office still steps in their trousers, one leg at a time. I don't believe I've ever seen anybody walk on water in Corning. If I do, I think I'll probably leave. But I want to show you we made a mistake. Right down in here, 
we were 0.05 cents under the average. And that, that bothers me because we're a proud group. We try to do the best for the organization and its members. So we're, gonna, we're going to find out why, what happened. And then there, back in May, we were a little lower. Now I know what happened there. True collective bargaining was really working because there were two packers in the state fighting one another for volume. And not only was that packer that we were giving the volume to fighting for more volume, but another outside packer was in there trying to take his volume. So we kind of tightened it up more and made it a little more difficult for those packers to get the volume they're looking for. And the market went up. In different areas, they were fighting, but it took the whole state average up. And that's what we're looking for. I don't think that that's a successful example right here of trying to achieve a cost of production plus a reasonable profit, because in 1979, we're at $60, and in 1983, we're at, what, uh, $40. But I'll tell you what that is successful. It's successful in marketing, in marketing alone. We have to have more bargaining, more volume to reverse that trend and bring the low to the high. And it can be done. And this right here, this example, is why you folks need the national farmers more now than when the first day that you've ever called yourself a farmer and a rancher. The importance of that is right there. I'd like to close today with a, I feel, is a, uh, a statement that I have to live with. I have to do something about. I have to understand it and keep it in mind. And that is, people in the livestock industry need to think of themselves as businessmen and women before they think of themselves as farmers and ranchers. They need to ask themselves some basic questions, such as, what is my business? And what do I produce? And do I plan to be here in the future? Thank you. At this time, I'd like to have Merle come up. Now, Merle and I have been traveling together for a good many years, off and on. I think probably the, one of the reasons I quit in 1973 is because of him. He was driving me crazy. <laughs> but I know one thing about Merle Sunken, that he happens to be the most dedicated individual in our livestock department. <coughs> Along with the dedication to the department, he has the dedication of the organization that no one can match. Merle's been a member of this organization for a good many years. He's come a long way through the hard knocks. He was a lot like most people that came into the home office in the early days. The only way that you learn something is by mistake, and you try not to make that mistake again. When I came back in 1980, Merle at that time wasn't the director of the department, but shortly after that he became director and deserved it more than anyone that I know and has worked harder for the hog division than anyone that I have known and probably will ever know. Merle? Thank you, Andy. And only one thing I don't like about Andy, he just talks a long time. But uh, I would like to relate some transparencies here for you this afternoon. I'd like to relate to you exactly 
in our opinion, what has happened in the hog industry in the past year, where the hog industry, I think, in our opinion, is going, and where you and I as hog producers should be fitting into that situation. The first transparency that I'm going to show you this afternoon is one on imports and exports, and I'm going to show you here that in 1980 to 1981 and to 1982, but I'm just going to compare the 1981 and 1982 figures here, and if you could see those, you will be able to detect that there's about 30,000 metric tons more export into the United States, excuse me, more exports out, or fewer exports. I'll have it here in a moment. The exports in the United States are some 30 million, 30,000 metric tons lower in 1982 than it was in 1981. And in 1982, there were 30,000 metric tons more imports than there were exports also. So we have some 60,000 metric tons of more pork in the United States in 1982 just through imports and exports. I think that's what the government has done for you and I as hog producers. The other part I think that the government has idly set by and allowed to happen in this country that we live in to you and I as hog producers, and that's the fact in night from 1978 through 1983, we have seen the per capita consumption of pork in the United States go from in 1980 from 68.3 pounds per person to an estimated this year of 1983 of 54 and a half pounds. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly where the government is uh, estimating the poultry to be also this year. So the first time in history, the poultry uh, per capita consumption and the pork will be the same. So I think that our government has idly set by and not worked in the behalf of the pork producers of this great nation. I'd like to now go in and get a very positive attitude because I think that's all the negativeness we need in this particular presentation. I'd like to show you what you have done as an organization. Now the figures that I'm going to be showing you, and I'll be showing you several transparencies here, and if you'll bear with me, I'll point out some very particular points of these transparencies that uh, we in the business of, of marketing your hogs and also the packing industry and the government uh, looks at these various type figures all the time from time to time. So let me show you what you producers and NFO has done in the past few years. This is a transparency of a five-year market from 1979 through 1983. And this is a five-year average, is based on the interior Iowa practical top country points, and is a mid-station market quoted each market day by the U.S. Market News Service, and are as accurate as humanly possible. Interior Iowa country mid-station quotations. And for an example, in January of 79, the average hog market, the practical top of all the hogs sold in the state of Iowa for January was $51.40. Well, that's not what I brought this transparency for. I brought the transparency for the fact that in 1979, in the month of the last week in October and the first week of November, your president, Devon Woodland, called a national sow sell-off program for your organization because of a very low market situation. And as you see here in this transparency, the October market was $33.98 average, and November was $35.09, and was staying in that category. All right, 
did it have any effect? Well, I think I and you as hog producers know how long it takes for a sow to have pigs and for those pigs to grow up, and it's approximately nine to 10 months, depending upon what type of a producer you are as an individual, but let's just use a nine month uh, program here and let's count them off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in the month of June and July of 1980, the hog market raised a little over $11 per hundredweight on an average for those two months. Would anybody pray tell me how that that could happen unless someone made it happen? And yes, your organization, you, you made it happen. You made it happen because you did something together. Well, then I often hear that you know, we in NFO, we do something, but nobody else follows along, and the non-members, they don't participate, and a lot of other things. So this year, when we called for a sow sell-off program on June the 8th of 1983, and by the way, let's look at that market. In June of 1983, you had a $44.86 average hog market, and it had been running for the year. Uh, in January, it was 56, in February, it was 56, and then all of a sudden, it started downhill. But in June, when the sow sell-off program was announced by your president, Devon Woodland, we started because he and the rest of us very definitely seen a tremendous buildup of hogs coming to market this fall, and because the sows weren't being sold off and were being held back, we seen a real tragedy coming. Now, I don't know that I necessarily truly believe in the law of supply and demand uh, as it is set today. The true law of supply and demand will work if everything is in balance, but it is not in balance today. But that's another story. I went and we started keeping records of exactly the number of hogs going through the seven major terminal markets. NFO people don't sell there. We don't deliver there, but I did want to see what the non-participating members were doing, the non-members were doing, the people that you and I have not talked to about this great organization. We wanted to see what they were doing with their sows. Were they taking advantage and holding back? I don't believe so. Because when we started it on June the 12th, 8th, excuse me, of 1983, you see that particular week, there was 9,397 sows sold on those terminal markets. The very next week it jumped to 13,066 sows, or an increase of 17% more sows sold on the terminal markets the following week. And it kept climbing and climbing and climbing till on September the 3rd, week ending September the 3rd, there was 80, or excuse me, 48 percent more sows moved on the terminal markets than there had been the previous year. The previous year there was 10,721 sows. In 1983 there was 15,894 sows. Do you think that happened by accident? Absolutely not. That happened 100 percent because of your farm organization that you are so proud of, and I'm so very, very proud of, came to life and came right up front and before the pig crop report came out and started it because we did have the accurate figures, we did see it coming, and we tried to prevent a total disaster in the hog market. Let's follow that through just one more step. We took the total number of sows slaughtered in the United States in 1982 and 83. Of course, the last two months here I have estimated, as you see. But in 1982, there were 4,127,106 sows sold in the United States. And already I know that I estimated the month of November just a little bit low. And December, I think, will also be a little low in these particular figures. But there should be approximately uh, 4 million, 
and I'm saying now 600,000 head of sows slaughtered in the United States this year. Well, are we going to see an $11 jump in the hog market nine months from now? No, I don't particularly believe we will because first off, we started $10 a hundred weight more than we started in 1979. Remember 1979 we had a $33 hog market when a sow sell off program started. This year we had a $44 hog market, but we seen where it was going and we tried to put some preventative actions into it and that will work. We have now slipped into the top $30 range on hogs, but what will happen? The hog market will go back up now. We will be in the low $40 range and you are now approaching another time where you and I as hog producers can lock in our cost of production plus a reasonable profit on our hogs in the months to come. Let me show you just a few more figures that I believe I can verify that with. Here's one I always like to show first though. This is called the law of supply and demand. And I guess it just aggravates me because of the things that I see happening in the hog industry. I took 1981 again in 1983. In January of 1981, for an example, we had a $40.69 hog market. In 1983, we had a $56.13 average hog market or a $15.44 difference with an 18% lower number of hogs being killed. Well, I'm not going to bore you with all these other figures because you can see them. But let's just drop down here to October and with a 15% lower number of slaughter hogs this month, we also lost $4 on your hog market. Up here you had 18% lower numbers. You had $15 more on the market. Down here you had a 15% lower numbers and a $4 lower market. So if anybody chooses to talk about supply and demand, why well, I also understand that, like I said a minute ago, if it's truly in balance, it will work. Here's the only transparency that I brought with me that I used last year, and this was a warning, because if you remember my presentation last year, I said that the hog producers just prior to our convention a year ago came, became very independent. I guess I would say we became greedy because we had a 54 to $58 hog market in that range. We forgot about forward contracting our hogs because we would not contract them for 51 to $52, which you could have done for the entire year of 1983, but we chose not to as individual producers. Well, it took you to a $37 hog market. And remember last year, this transparency of the seven-year cycle, 1975, the local market went from about $38 to a top of $60. 1982, seven years later, it went from $44 up to about $64, and the terminal markets went as high as 68. And I warned you know, what was going to happen. We talked about it. Lock-in hogs for 1983. We became greedy as we did seven years ago. You did the exact same thing seven years ago, and the hog market seven years ago in 1976 went to less than $30. And in 1983, only because of your organization calling for a sow sell-off program that that was curtailed up to about a $37, $38 range, and now we'll go back up. But once again, you and I as hog producers got a little bit too greedy, and we didn't lock in the gains that we had made 